My goodness, good morning, good afternoon, whatever it is for you, I hope you're having a fantastic day. My name is Zach Schaumler, this is Strong Opinion Sports. Thank you so very much for tuning in. Today is Wednesday, May 23rd, I guess it's the evening of Wednesday, May 23rd. I just watched the Cavs and Celtics Game 5, um, and that's really where I want to start this podcast. It's, I'm going to get right to it, um, there's not a lot on the show today, it might be a shorter episode of the show. But I really want to start with the Cavs and Celtics. It was a great game. It was fantastic. Um, I, was it, though? I, I don't know. We're going to get into it. It was, it was interesting, and I'm really excited to talk about it. My, my biggest questions going into the Cavs and Celtics Game 5 uh, tonight, there, there were two of them, two big questions I had, and they were, can the Cavaliers win a game in Boston? Can the Cavaliers go from Cleveland to Boston and win a game? Appears, I guess, well, we found out they can't. And the other question was, will intensity and effort be an issue for Cleveland? Will their effort be a problem? And it wasn't for them. Intensity was not an issue for the Cavaliers, but turnovers. Turnovers were the big, big issue, at least from the beginning. You look at the numbers, and they only had 15 turnovers. The Cleveland Cavaliers only had 15 turnovers tonight, but it felt like so much more. And what happened was, early in the first quarter, the Celtics got on a roll. They had a bunch of steals. The Cavs were just awful. They looked like terrible, looked like crap, turning the ball over left and right. And the Celtics got a good lead and never looked back. They were up 10. It felt like the entire game. In fact, that's basically what happened. Um, I think some of that goes to the Cavaliers for sure. I want to give credit to the Boston Celtics defense, and I want to give credit to both because you know the, the Celtics played great on defense. The Celtics were fantastic. They The Cavaliers could not penetrate the Celtics defense. It was awful. Their movement wasn't very good. And a lot of that is credit again to the Boston Celtics and the way they play defense. But we saw many times it wasn't a lack of intensity, but it was like a lack of mental. I don't know what it was. The the Cavs looked like they weren't locked in in the first quarter. I mean, they had lackadaisical passes, really bad passes. Jason Tatum had a couple steals. And uh, the Cavs, I mean, the Cavs looked terrible. It just was not a I don't know what you say. I, I keep saying, you know, the Cavs are the better roster, but it's it's pretty hard to to believe that after a game like tonight. Uh, so I want to take you to seven minutes left in the game. I want to skip ahead because with seven minutes left in the game, the score was 71 to 83 uh, and LeBron was down 11. And with LeBron down 11, seven minutes left, I'm like, all right, LeBron, let's see it. I want you to make it happen. And uh, <laughs> surprise, surprise. LeBron James did not take over offensively. He did not make it happen, and the Cavs ultimately lost. And that's now the second time this has happened in this series. If you go back to Game 2, a similar scenario, down 11 with 10 minutes left, and LeBron didn't make it happen. And so I'm, I'm really like, I, we're just learning LeBron offensively is not a guy who takes over late. He's not going to dominate the game and bring his team back. And I can't help but wonder, what would Kobe Bryant do? What would Michael Jordan do? I know there's a lot of GOAT discussion out there, And I guess we're learning, it's just not LeBron's game. He's just not a guy who's going to take over offensively late in a game. No matter how much we wait for it, it's not going to happen. Uh, Now, the big question again was, can the Cleveland Cavaliers win a game in Boston? And the pretty obvious answer is no. It seems like they cannot. I I just, it's awful. They've played terrible every time they go to Boston. And the truth is, if the Cavs want to win this series... They have to, at some point, win a game in Boston. We may see this series go seven games. I mean, it's the Cavs are night and day. Watching them go from a home game to an away game, the Cavs are just a different basketball team. Now, I do believe this series is closer than people think. I, I, well, I don't know how. I don't know. I can't speak for other people. I know at one point it seems like everyone's going to one extreme or the other. Oh, the Cavs are going to win, or oh, the Celtics are going to dominate. No, I think the series is actually quite close. I think, again, we're going to see possibly a seven-game series. And if you look at the, the history of the series, only one game was within 10 points. I mean, every game appears to be a blowout, and that's just how the NBA playoffs are these days. Any more so, the, the NBA playoffs are blowouts. That's just how the games are played. I, I, don't, I can't speak to it. Maybe it's threes. Maybe it's effort. I don't know. But at, more and more, we're seeing NBA playoff games be blowouts, and you can't really read much into it. The Cavs will have a blowout. The Celtics will have a blowout. They're actually quite evenly matched back and forth, but you just never know which team you're going to get which night. I think there's we need to focus on LeBron James. Is it LeBron James' fault? And you look at the stats. Here's what I see. Between LeBron James and Kevin Love, the two of them combined for 40 points tonight. Now, the rest of the starters combined for the Cavaliers 
combined to score 10 points. They were two for 14 shooting. They were awful. Now, LeBron James, LeBron had 26 points. Kevin Love had 14, but nobody else on their in their starting lineup. In fact, nobody else on the Cavs roster had double figures. I, I get it. People say that LeBron James, you know, he needs to, he shouldn't need all that help. He should be able to win by himself. But how many how many teams do you know that can have only two players in double figures and win a game? It's just not very often. And if you look at the Celtics, the Celtics had five people score over 10 points. Five people for the Celtics were in double figures. The Cavs only had two players. That's not good. Again, I've been saying all year that, <clears throat> I guess all series at least, that the Cavaliers, they have a better roster. The Cavaliers are more talented. I don't know. Does it doesn't matter because the Cavs are incredibly streaky. Like, talent is great, but streaky, that's important too. If you're not dependable, how can I rely on you to win games? And again, it reminds me of Cam Newton. Cam Newton, a great quarterback in the NFL. He's awesome. He's incredibly talented. His highs are incredible, but his lows are just as bad. And so I just, I, I look at the Cavs and I see that the only person who shows up every single night is LeBron James. The Cavaliers simply are not dependable. And so even though LeBron James shows up every night, you can't say the same for everybody else. I want to take you through this series in game three. So the two games that the Cavaliers won were game three and game four. In game three, here is what the numbers look like. Tristan Thompson had 10 points. George Hill had 13. J.R. Smith had 11. And Kyle Korver had 14 points. Now in game four, another game they won. Tristan Thompson had 13. George Hill had 13. J.R. Smith had nine points. He had three three-pointers. And Kyle Korver had 14 points. When LeBron James has those guys score points and actually contribute to the game, they win. But we're learning that when they don't, they obviously they can't win a game. It's, it's very simple. Look at the stats tonight. Tristan Thompson had one point. He didn't even show up to play. George Hill only had seven. Kyle Korver had seven. And the worst of them all is J.R. Smith only had two points. The Cavs often rely on J.R. Smith as a three-point shooter. And guess what? <laughs> he didn't have a single one tonight. I think he had two free throws. Look, I trust LeBron. LeBron, it's how can you bet against LeBron? He's in his 15th season and he's still dominating. But I do not for a minute trust the Cavaliers roster. LeBron James, we've learned, simply is not enough by himself. So that's why if, I had, if I'm a betting man, if someone had a gun to my head, say, which team do you believe in? I would say I believe in the Boston Celtics. Whether it's in six games or seven games, the Celtics are simply more reliable. And it seems like they may go on to win this series. Like, I love LeBron. I trust LeBron, but I don't trust his teammates. If you don't get a good game from Tristan Thompson, George Hill, J.R. Smith, or Kyle Korver, the Cavaliers can't win. And we have not seen any kind of consistency from them. And not to mention, they play well at home. But Game 7 is going to be in Boston. And his teammates so far have not shown up in Boston even once. I mean, it's a it's a great... The NBA playoffs are in a great spot. Oh my goodness. This ser these Both series, both conference finals are just fantastic. You have the Celtics up 3-2. to two. LeBron James is an underdog. That's fantastic for the NBA. And then you have the Warriors and the Rockets. They're tied at two apiece. That's fantastic. Both series could go to at least six games. That is so, so good for the NBA. That's what I want to see as an NBA fan. Now, I want to talk about the Warriors and Rockets series, because let me tell you, I am a genius. I am the smartest man that ever walked on the face of the earth. Remember, remember what I said in last episode? I said the Warriors would win in five games. Uh, yeah, I was wrong. I was, I was, I was dead wrong. Like, I, I just, you know what happens sometimes? The Rockets beat the Warriors last night, 94, uh, 95 to 92. And so now the series is tied 2-2. Two to two. They're going to go to at least six games in this series. The Warriors-Rockets, they appear to also be quite close. And, you know, I saw something last night while the Warriors were playing the Rockets that made me consider, hey, maybe the Rockets could actually pull it out. Maybe the Rockets could win this series. So I'm watching it, and I just, I don't know how to explain it. Here's what I saw. It's not statistics. It might make you angry that it's not. But it just looks like the Rockets care more. It looks like it, this series means more to the Rockets. And it makes sense. Look, the Warriors already have theirs. The Rockets sit at home every playoffs and think about how can we beat the Golden State Warriors. The, the, the Rockets, James Harden, Chris Paul, they watched the finals last year. They watched the NBA finals from home. 
All they can think about all year is, we must beat the Golden State Warriors. And my initial reaction when I'm watching the this emotion, when I'm watching the game, you know, the way they're celebrating, the way they're emoting, it looks like the game matters more to the Rockets. As I'm watching this, my brain thinks this, I'm concerned. I'm thinking, ooh, if they care more, maybe they'll choke. Maybe under pressure, maybe what matters most, James Harden or Chris Paul or Clint Capella, maybe they're going to tense up. And in the moment, because they care so much, they're not going to make it. And the truth is, in game four, last night, we saw the exact opposite. All the pressure was on the Rockets. They're down two games to one. And uh, the Rockets were clutch. James Harden was clutch. Chris Paul was incredibly clutch. Chris Paul probably played the best game of his career. And you know who wasn't clutch? The Rockets, uh, the Warriors, excuse me, the Warriors were not good at the end of the game. They were not good in the moment. I saw Steph Curry jacking up shots left and right. Klay Thompson couldn't hit. And now NBA, Kevin Durant just went MIA. Kevin Durant just disappeared. In the last five minutes, I was waiting and waiting and waiting. Come on, Kevin Durant. Come on, Kevin Durant. Take over. Take over. I think I saw something. I don't think he even shot in the final five, four or five minutes. Look, I, I just, I'm watching and I'm like, everybody but Kevin Durant is shooting right now. And it, it just was weird. It was like in the moment, the Warriors couldn't pull it out. I just, that's, that's not great. I think the Rockets have a real shot to win this series. I think it matters more to them. I think they're hungrier, which is a real significant thing. And I, I just, I also, I think, I think Steph Curry's hurt. We, we can all acknowledge Steph Curry has not had a great series. And Steph Curry, he may not be as good as Kevin Durant. He is more valuable. He matters more to that team. They can win games without Kevin Durant. They struggle to win games without Steph Curry. And right now, Steph Curry does not appear to be at 100%. Um, it's, it's a really close series. I think the Rockets have absolutely a chance to win. I don't know. I'm not going to make any predictions. I'm, I'm obviously, I'm done with that, but I just, um, I, I'm not, I'm not just making up. I do think the Rockets actually have a shot to beat the Golden State Warriors. And that surprises me and concerns me a little bit. Um, and I, I don't have an answer for why. I think it just, there's a couple of reasons. I mean, again, I think Steph Curry's hurt. I think it matters more to the Rockets. And I'm really curious to see what happens down the road. Uh, what I love, both series are incredibly close. Both the Cavaliers and the Celtics, both the Rockets and the Warriors. And again, I want to repeat, LeBron is an underdog. He's down three to two, and that is so fantastic. And again, the Warriors Rockets feels like it's up for grabs. So I'm excited for the rest of the conference finals. And again, even for the NBA finals, I, I want to make a prediction, something that I, I know I'm, I'm wrong all the time. Screw it. Who cares? I think that if somehow by some miraculous circumstance, if the Rockets can beat the Warriors and if LeBron can beat the Celtics, if we see an NBA finals between LeBron James and the Houston Rockets, I actually believe we could see. LeBron James win the finals. Just a weird, weird nugget. This may be something I'm saying now and you'll totally forget about it in a couple weeks. Um, and it may not matter, but it's possible. I, I think LeBron James could actually beat the Houston Rockets. I don't think he could beat the Golden State Warriors, but I think because it's LeBron and because it's James Harden, I think that LeBron James could beat the Houston Rockets. Just, hey, save it for later. We'll talk about it someday down the road. But I want to plant that seed now because if we ever get there, that could be a quite interesting NBA Finals. All right. I guess one more thing I want to say about this basketball before we move on. I find the Boston Celtics incredibly likable. I dropped my pen. You know, it's they're tough. They give a ton of effort. They always say the right things. The Boston Celtics are fantastic at the podium. They're led by Al Horford. I just, I really, really respect the Boston Celtics. I think they're a ton of fun to watch. I like their guys. Um, and what I really like about them is this. I love the way the Boston Celtics built their team. They didn't tank. The Boston Celtics did not tank. Look at the, the 76ers. The 76ers benefited from tanking. They got three top draft picks. Two of them worked out. It appears Mark L. Fultz is somewhere in the ether. We don't know what to make of him. But uh, again, look around the league. Sacramento's tanking. The Mavericks are tanking. Phoenix has been tanking for years, and it's not working. And I just... I'm not a fan of tanking. So if any team can rebuild their roster without having to purposely try to lose, that is something I really value. And I want to give the Celtics a ton of credit. I know we're on year two of the Celtics are back, but 
I just think it's really fantastic that the way they built their team was by outsmarting everybody else. Danny Ainge, the head of basketball operations, I think general manager for the Celtics is fantastic. Danny Mage made a series of great, really fantastic trades, trading for Kyrie Irving, trading for away their big three, Kevin Garnett, Paul Pierce, and the way they've built this roster is just well done and fantastic. And then the last way they outsmarted everybody else, they got Brad Stevens. Brad Stevens is a superstar head coach. He's fantastic. And he's the final reason why I love to watch the Boston Celtics. I love the way the Celtics built their roster. I'm, I'm, it's hard not to be excited for them because they did it the right way. They didn't tank. They did not intentionally try to lose. And they seem like really good guys who are hard to root against. You may or may not know, um, there, were, there was news today. News came out about the NFL's new national anthem policy. I'm not going to talk about it. I'm not going to talk about it on this show Um, because what I noticed today when everyone was talking, everyone reacted to the National Anthem NFL story. First of all, it's a huge story. If you want to hear about it from someone, I'm sure there's plenty of other people out there who have their opinion. I'm not going to tell you mine. I just don't want to spend much time on it because what I saw was everybody reacting to it. I saw a bunch of political pundits reacting to it. There's one guy in particular I follow who's really into politics. He did a big thing about it. And I was like, you know what? This National Anthem story seems more like politics than sports, and this is, again, a sports show. Strong opinion sports. It's not strong opinion politics. I'm not going to talk about it anymore. Let's move on. I want to remind you, you can subscribe to Strong Opinion Sports on iTunes, on SoundCloud, and on YouTube. You can find the full entire hour-long podcast on YouTube, as well as my best, most interesting clips. If you like Strong Opinion Sports as much as I do, Help me grow Strong Opinion Sports by telling your friends about this show. We have good stuff ahead. I'm going to talk about how how could the Giants maybe succeed. I know I trash on the Giants all the time. I don't mean to. I just don't believe in them. But I want to look at things from the other perspective. Here's how I believe the Giants could. I'll tell you in a minute how the Giants could maybe succeed and do, do well this season. Another thing I'm going to talk about later down the road, I'm going to talk about Reuben Foster. Everybody know you're listening to this podcast. You're probably a 49ers fan. It seems like everybody who listens to this podcast is. Reuben Foster's news is a big deal. His case got dismissed, his domestic violence case. We're going to talk about that. Um, I'm not going to focus really much on the domestic violence part. Again, it's sports, not politics. I'm also going to talk about Kawhi Leonard. I would not make a trade for Kawhi Leonard. That's not what I would do. And I'll tell you why coming up ahead. So first, let's talk about the Giants. So Giants fans and I have, we have battled back and forth, man. Giants fans do not like me. Because I've said, I don't believe in the New York Giants. I don't think that they are set up to have a good season. I don't think they're set up to succeed. I strongly, strongly oppose their decision to draft Saquon Barkley rather than Sam Darnold. But I want to try to give the Giants the benefit of the doubt. I have my opinion, but I want to see it from the other perspective. And so I'm going to look at something quite a little bit quite differently today. This is how I believe the Giants could succeed. I have several reasons that, you know, go against my way of thinking and say, you know, Zach, you may be wrong. This may be a counter argument to me how the Giants could possibly succeed. So the first thing I want to talk about is two years ago. Let's not forget this Giants roster two years ago went 11 and five. Two years ago, this was a great football team. And last season, they were decimated by injuries. They had injury after injury after injury. I believe they lost, was it four? Was it five receivers, four receivers? Some of them, they lost their whole receiving core. So, of course, Eli Manning struggled. And they had just a, they were decimated by injuries all around their team. This roster is still largely a lot of the same players who went 11 and 5. And so I, I would point out maybe their roster is better than we realize. Another thing to mention is that this year, the Giants brought in a new head coach, Pat Shermer who I like Pat Shermer. Pat Shermer last year was the offensive coordinator for the Minnesota Vikings. And Pat Shermer knows how to get the most out of a struggling quarterback. Pat Shermer made Case Keenum look fantastic. He almost got the Vikings to a Super Bowl. It's very possible we could see Pat Shermer, the new Giants head coach, have a similar effect on Eli Manning. Maybe Eli Manning's career could be reinvigorated with a new offensive coach that could help him succeed. It's very possible. Now, I don't believe that's true, but we'll talk about that in a minute. Another reason why the Giants could succeed this year is, let's be honest, 
Saquon Barkley is a real star. Saquon Barkley is going to be a fantastic running back. I would have chosen Sam Darnold, but regardless, Saquon Barkley is a great player. He's going to have it probably a great year. He could be rookie of the year. And so those are a couple reasons why I believe the Giants could succeed. Remember, they're two years removed from an 11-5 and five season. They had a ton of injuries last year. It's largely the same roster. They also got Saquon Barkley. And remember, they have a new head coach, a new head coach who could reinvigorate Eli Manning's career. Now, me personally, I don't believe in the Giants, but I understand why Giants fans get. I understand why Giants fans believe in their team. I want to say that over and over again. I understand Giants fans. I understand why when I say, hey, the Giants are going to have a terrible year, I get why Giants fans get invigorated and angry. I understand. Because not only does it work on paper, you can build a logical reason on paper, but remember, Giants fans have an emotional tie to their team. And when I say, hey, I don't think the Giants are going to win, that's like a personal attack. I understand that. But there are a couple reasons why I do not believe in the Giants. I want to repeat them if you haven't heard them before. Look at the schedule for the New York Giants. Their first seven games in particular are incredibly trying. And even later down the road, you're going to see this most of the year. Most of the time the Giants are playing a football game, they're going to have an inferior roster and an inferior quarterback. Now, now, so the other team's quarterback will often be better and often the other team's roster will be better. That's not necessarily a knock on the Giants roster because I do think the Giants have an upper middle ro- It's possible if everyone comes back from their injuries the same. They maybe have a middling roster. They might be better than the bottom half of the league. The problem is the Giants play the top half of the league for most of their games. I think they have 13 games against teams who were either in the playoffs or in a playoff hunt last year, and that's not good for the Giants. Another reason is this. Pat Shermer's awesome. We know he was a great offensive coordinator, but what do we really know about Pat Shermer? What, what do we know? We know he's a good offensive coordinator. Can he be a good head coach? Eh. And the, the, the third and final reason why I just do not believe in the New York Giants. My opinion, I get why. I don't really understand why Giants fans believe so heavily in Eli Manning, but I certainly do not. Remember, like two or three years ago, Giants fans were ready to get rid of Eli Manning. And then they benched him last year and everyone decided to change their minds. Screw the coach. He hates our guy. I feel like my entire life, Giants fans have always hated Eli Manning. And now at the end of the, his career, Giants fans have suddenly decided, actually, you know what? This guy we've hated for years, we don't hate him that much. He can stay. It's weird. It's a weird switch. And I just cannot put my faith in Eli Manning. I just do not buy it. I don't believe in him. But I, again, I get it. I understand why Giants fans believe in their team. I don't. I do not believe in the Giants. In fact, I made a bet with someone. Uh, very public. I want to I want to keep revisiting this because I think it's a, a fun story to follow all year. I made a bet with James Hollister, one of the YouTube commenters. I said this. If the Giants win nine or more games, if the Giants win nine games or more, or not one but both, or if the Giants have more wins than the 49ers, I will personally go out with money I don't have. I will buy a Saquon Barkley jersey. I'll wear it on the show and I will send it to... James Hollister, but I simply do not believe in Giants fans. Again, I understand why. There's a logical reason. There's maybe a better roster than people realize. They have Saquon Barkley. They have Pat Shermer. Maybe Pat Shermer can save Eli Manning's career, but I do not buy Eli Manning. I don't believe in the Giants, but I understand why Giants fans believe in their team. All right, we have have two things left I want to talk about. I'm going to drink some water first. Uh, it's, It's a weird day at the house. A bunch of my friends are actually over. My friends are all upstairs um, hanging out. And I said, you know what? I got to go. I was watching the, the game with them. And I said, you know what? Game's over. I'm going to go downstairs and record a podcast. It's what I do. I'm, I'm really dedicated. I want to get content out. I just, um, I, I try to do a podcast three days a week. I'm not going to waver. It's going to be, what, 45 minutes? And I can go back upstairs, hang out with my friends. And you know what? The minute my friends leave, I'll come back down. I'll edit my podcast. I'll put it out on YouTube. So, um, I just, I, I think it's the right move. I, I'm, I'm very dedicated. I'm very committed to get strong opinion sports out Monday, Wednesday, Friday. That's what I want to do. It's my passion. It's my favorite thing in the world. And I'm working incredibly hard to build this podcast. And I'm really grateful for your guys, uh, feedback and your guys, uh, support. It means a lot to me. So I, I really love this show and, uh, I'm just really grateful for you guys. So I want to talk now about Reuben Foster, Reuben Foster, the linebacker for 
the San Francisco 49ers, Reuben Foster had his charges dismissed. And I, I just want to say this. I love the way the 49ers handled this situation. So Reuben Foster, he's had his, he was in court for a while. It was, everyone's up in the air. Is he going to be able to play? Is he not? Could he have faced jail time? Yada, yada. Um, now, the charges have been dismissed. And Reuben Foster has been, I'm not going to say a word. I don't know. He, he seems like he's, I wanted to say acquitted, but I don't actually know what acquitted means. So I'm just going to move on. Reuben Foster is, is, appears to be free to go. He can play football and rejoin the 49ers this year. I love, I love, I love the way the 49ers handled this situation. I do not believe they could have done a better job if you wrote it up. I, it was really fantastic. First of all, they waited. Because let's be honest about Reuben Foster. He's too good of a football player to just release the minute he has a little bit of trouble. I, I hate to say it. Maybe it's politically incorrect to say that, but Reuben Foster is too talented to just boot off your roster the minute you have any kind of trouble. He's worth the trouble. He's that good of a football player. But again, I really liked the way the 49ers handled it. They said, hey, if he's found guilty, we're going to have to let him go. But I do. I, what I like about this is that the 49ers stuck by their guy. Remember, Reuben Foster's not perfect. He's had trouble. This is not his only run-in with the law. He's had other issues before. And, and now the 49ers have an opportunity to make an impact on Reuben Foster's life. They have an opportunity to help him, not just on the field, but also off the field. Remember, the 49ers have a ton of veteran leadership. Richard Sherman, the huge free agent signing this offseason. I think it's more important to him. Uh, I think Richard Sherman is more meaningful to the team actually off the field than he is on the field. A guy like Richard Sherman can help foster Reuben Foster. Funny how that is. He can mentor him and help him learn and develop, not just as a football player, but also as a man. And right now, the 49ers have an opportunity to help Reuben Foster. Kind of similar to the way the Vikings once upon a time helped a young and troubled Randy Moss. The 49ers have an opportunity to help Reuben Foster get back on the straight and narrow and keep him involved. And Football is a good way to do that. But I'm so glad they stuck with their guy because, again, the 49ers uh, had too good of an asset. I hate to call him that, but let's be very honest about Reuben Foster. He's just too good to bail on. They said, we're going to stick with our guy. We're going to play it out, see what happens. And I'm glad they did. I think the 49ers did absolutely the right thing. And I'm very excited to see how Reuben Foster develops, how he moves forward. I think the 49ers have everything in place to support him off the field. And I think they handled this situation absolutely perfectly good for them. They got a great player out of there because they supported their guy. And hopefully Reuben Foster can clean things up off the field. I'm very excited for the 49ers moving forward. And I'm hopeful that Reuben Foster can stay out of trouble and uh, stay on the straight and narrow. Because I, I like him. He's, I, I just, um, I'm rooting for him as a person because that's a good story. If he can get things figured out off the field. The last thing I want to talk about is this. <clears throat> I talked on Monday's episode about Kawhi Leonard, and I said that the Celtics should not trade for Kawhi Leonard. Let me drink some water real quick. I, I think it's important to say that not only do I, I think that the Celtics shouldn't trade for Kawhi Leonard, if I'm, an, if I'm an NBA general manager, if I am an NBA general manager, I'm not going to make a move to trade for Kawhi Leonard. I just wouldn't, even though I can acknowledge, look, Kawhi Leonard is a fantastic basketball player. In fact, he might be able to help a team, but I don't think, I don't think there's a team in the, the, uh, the East, the Eastern Conference, who can use him. I do not believe there's a team in the Eastern Conference who can take Kawhi Leonard and he can push them over the edge so they can win a championship. Because if the problem with Kawhi Leonard is this. He costs a ton. You're going to have to lose assets for Kawhi Leonard. Kawhi Leonard is going to cost like a Kyrie or Gordon Hayward in a draft pick. I mean, he's not cheap. And there's only two teams in the Eastern Conference that could maybe make a move for Kawhi Leonard. That is, again, the 76ers and the Boston Celtics. Because they're the only two teams that could risk taking a, um, a Kawhi Leonard and using him for a year to get him over the hump. Now, the biggest reason why I would not take Kawhi Leonard is he's only got one year left on his contract. You're going to trade a lot of assets away for Kawhi Leonard, and you're only going to get him for one year. You're basically renting a player for a year. That's not very smart. That's not sustainable. I don't like that. 
And uh, let's take it. Let's remember Paul George. We saw the Oklahoma City Thunder do that last year. We're going to take Paul George. We're going to recruit him. We're going to keep him around. We think we can convince Paul George to stay. They traded for him. He had one year left on his contract. Paul George is all but out of Oklahoma City. He's about to leave the Oklahoma City Thunder. And I would not want to take that risk with Kawhi Leonard. I love Kawhi Leonard. And the only reason I would trade for Kawhi Leonard is if I thought next season he could put my team over the edge and help us win a championship. And the problem is there isn't a team out there that feels that way. And any team that is, again, the Celtics are close, but I think the Celtics would have to give up far too much to get Kawhi Leonard, and I just don't think it's worth it. I wouldn't give up assets to trade for Kawhi Leonard because you're only going to get him for one year. It just I don't know if that makes sense, but I, I think that when you trade for Kawhi Leonard, you're not trading him where he necessarily wants to be. You're making him go somewhere. And in a year after that, he's going to be able, free to go wherever he wants. And so I simply would not trade for Kawhi Leonard at all. I love Kawhi. I think Kawhi is an amazing player. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying Kawhi isn't fantastic, but I just don't think it's a smart move. Because we learned from Paul George. When you trade for a guy with one year left on his contract, there's no guarantee he's going to stay there. And a, a trading for a guy like Kawhi Leonard is going to cost a lot. I'm not going to give up assets. My future, I'm not going to give up important, meaningful players so that I can have Kawhi Leonard. Because again, we've learned the way you build a great NBA roster, you have a collection of stars. One star, Giannis, up in Milwaukee, that's not enough. One star, Damian Lillard, there's two stars in Portland. They're not enough. You need multiple stars. You need a collection of stars. So trading one star for another doesn't actually get you closer to a championship. And why would you trade one star who has three years left on his contract for Kawhi Leonard, who only has one? I would not trade for Kawhi Leonard. I love him, but I would not make a move to go and get Kawhi Leonard. Particularly because, I know I'm, I'm keep continuing to go, but the Spurs have said, we're not comfortable trading Kawhi Leonard in the Western Conference. It's not going to happen. So what that means is everybody on the Western Conference Everybody in the West is out. They're not going to get him. And it only makes sense to trade him to a team in the West because there's only two teams in the Eastern Conference who have a chance next year of winning a championship, and they'd have to give up too much. So I would not make a move for Kawhi Leonard. I'd simply wait a year, and then I'd go get him. This kind of reminds me, the last thing I'm going to say, it reminds me of Carmelo Anthony. I remember when Carmelo Anthony really, really wanted to go to the New York Knicks. And so he said, trade for me now instead of waiting the next year and, and going there as a free agent. And it really cost them. They lost a lot because they went, they were impatient. And if you are Kawhi Leonard, I would just be patient and wait one more year and then go get him in free agency. I would not make a trade to go get Kawhi Leonard. All right, that's all I have today, guys. Uh, I know it was a shorter episode. I hope it was interesting, though. I try to be, that's my goal. My goal is not to be long. My goal is to be interesting. I want to make good content you guys can enjoy. That's all I have. Thank you so very much. I really appreciate it. We'll be back Friday. I've already begun preparing Friday's show. It's going to be really good. It's going to be really beefy. It'll make up for a shorter episode today. So thank you so much. I'll be back Friday. I hope you guys have a great day. I'm going to go see Star Wars tomorrow. I can't wait. Um... Whether you're boycotting it or not, I don't know. I just know that Han Solo was my favorite character ever growing up. I love Han Solo so much, and um, I'm, I'm hoping that... I'm hopeful. I don't know that it's going to be good, but I'm, I'm hoping it is. And remember, if you don't know, by the way, before I sign off, I have two other podcasts. I have a podcast called Zach Schaumler's Unpopular Opinion. It's not sports. It's nothing else. It's just me. It's me talking about my life, about things that bother me. It's basically... I think it's pretty close to stand-up comedy, quite honestly. I think the, especially the first episode is hilarious. I talk about how my grandma's memorial service, her, her funeral, was actually quite awful and really, but not, not in a terrible way, not in a miserable way. It was miserable and hilariously awful. Like, it was hilarious. It was actually quite funny. So I hope you guys go check it out, Zach Schaumler's Unpopular Opinion. And if you love movies, my two favorite topics in the entire world, I love strong opinion sports. I love making sports. Sports are my, my favorite topic in the world. My other favorite topic in the world is movies. My two favorite things, if I had to pick two things, the only two things I had to pay attention to the rest of my life, it would be sports and it would be movies. I'd also do a movie podcast called Zach's, uh, called Zach's Movie Club. It's called Zach's Movie Club. Um, I started it about a month ago. It's a separate YouTube channel. You can go find it. But 
Um, that's all I have, guys. Remember, you can subscribe to Strong Opinion Sports on iTunes, on SoundCloud, and on YouTube. You can find the full entire hour-long podcast on YouTube as well as my best, most interesting clips. If you like Strong Opinion Sports as much as I do, help me grow this channel by telling your friends about this show. That's all I have. Thank you so much. I hope you have a great day. Go see Solo. Uh, I think it's going to be great this weekend. I hope so. Actually, you know, I got to say, I don't know that it's going to be great. I'm actually quite concerned, but I hope it's good. That's all I have. But um, bam, we're done.